So welcome everyone. It's great to see you all here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Caitlin Pena. I am the Director of Operations and Programs for the Center for Election Science. Um, as you all probably know, if, you, if, if you're here, uh, Fargo just had their first approval voting election. So it's super exciting, a big historic event. Um, and I'm really happy to see that all of you are here to kind of celebrate with us and also, you know, take a look at these results, talk about what the voters thought about it, um, and maybe talk about some plans for the future as well. So thank you all for being here. Um, we've also obviously got Jed Limke here. He is the leader of Reform Fargo. Um, he started kind of the initiative in Fargo to get approval voting implemented there. Um, and he has been working on making sure the voters were educated ahead of uh, this, um, this first election as well. Um, and then Aaron Hamlin is on the line too. He is our executive director. Um, Kirsten Elliott, she's our director of philanthropy. I'm not sure if she'll be speaking much, but just she's on here just in case she does uh, decide to pop in and say something. Um, and then we might have, have our director of campaigns and advocacy, Chris, uh, Chris Rally, join us in a little while. Um, so that's, that's the cast of characters here. It's good to see you all. Um, just so you know how this will go, um, I have some questions and, and some discussion that I kind of want to lead with Jed first. Um, so we'll go through that and then we will open it up for a Q&A later. Um, so you can feel free to type in the comments uh, in the comments section and um, I'll moderate through that and we can, we can bring your questions up. Um, or if you want to be able to say your question out loud, um, just use the raise your hand feature that you can see when you click on the participants button. You'll see a little feature that says raise your hand. So you can click on that um, and then I can unmute you so that you can um, speak your comment. Um, I see there's a couple, yeah, there's a couple uh, comments in the chat. Um, Kirsten says she sees lots of familiar faces. Um, there's definitely lots of familiar faces on here, so that's exciting. Um, but without further ado, I guess we'll get started. So Jed, are, are you prepared? Have you um, been able to eat a few bites before, before getting started? Okay, cool. No worries. I know it's, it's kind of um, uh, dinner time right now. I, I ate a little bit early today in preparation for this. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's so great to see you. Uh, how, how did you feel about the election? What was it like filling out your first approval voting ballot after all of the hard work you did? Oh no, you're muted. Sorry. Just a second. I thought I unmuted you, but you muted yourself back. Yep. Okay. There you go. Oh, you, you're muted again. We're in a vicious cycle. I don't know. Did you? It'll work now. Okay. There right you there. go. Okay. Yes. Uh, what did you ask me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it was a long muting cycle. So how yeah. the first approval voting election, how'd you feel? What was it like filling out your ballot when you put all that work in to, you know, get it passed? It was good. Um, I waited way too long to fill out my ballot. I actually actually to go drop it off at the courthouse um but yeah it, it felt really good <laughs> to do it so yeah a, a lot of many years uh, literally effort in getting to this point and i'm really i'm happy that one made it through so <laughs> i mean there will be giant asterisks asterisks that word um all over uh, this year's history books but um yeah we did it so <laughs> so far so good did you do anything fun on election night? I know, I mean, it's in the middle of the pandemic, so you can't kind yeah. of like go out and... Yeah, um, so yeah, normally for election night activities, I, we do group activities. Like I think um, when we're waiting to find out if we had won, we were all bowling. Um, when we were waiting to find out if our results were certified, we um, went and played volleyball. I'm trying to think of what, um, I, I believe on election night that actually, um, I was golfing. So that's, that's how election night went for me. So yeah. That's a great socially distanced activity. To <laughs> exactly. On election night. <laughs> yes. And Fargo has lots of low priced public courses. So it was a nice place to be. 
yeah, that's awesome. So you did mention that there are lots of asterisks, asterisks <laughs> See, you around, can't say either, yeah. <laughs> yeah, around this election. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? What, how, how did the pandemic affect this election? It affected it a ton, uh, to be honest, um, as, as it's affecting everything. Um, in the end, we had um, seven candidates, six of whom uh, were active, one of which had claimed to have dropped out. Um, and in the end, the three people that uh, voters had heard of, um, you know, before 2020, were the three who came out very much on top. Um, as a reminder, uh, this was block style approval voting. You could vote or you could elect two people um, in the end to the city commission. Um, and yes, two of the three people that have a history in this town that's known uh, were the ones that were elected. But um, of the kind of unknowns, um, the lowest vote percentage uh, that an unknown got was 16% of the vote, which is frankly, I mean, that's, that's unheard of, you know, first past the post election that's split this many ways. So it was, and I believe, you know, if you voted for one of them, especially, it's because you did, you know, believe in that person. So it was nice to see um, these results come out. Um, I felt I feel kind of bad for the woman who got last place because she was actually beaten out by one of the people who said that he had canceled his campaign early in the year. Um, but that's just how it is. I don't, don't know how much he actually canceled it though. Cause I still saw yard signs showing up. So I don't know that guy, I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> that's interesting that there were still yard signs going out even yeah. despite, despite having canceled. So I wonder yeah. if that was some, yeah, that's, that's a bit odd. Yeah, um, but know. but that was a really good point that you made about um, you know having having a seven way slash six way race and the lowest percentage only being sixteen percent. That mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's pretty unheard of. Yeah. In, a, in a plurality election. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you feel like um, that candidate uh, who got the lowest amount? Do you think that she was able to kind of pool from people who maybe wouldn't have voted for her otherwise if it was under plurality or I mean I don't, I don't know that you can make any of those assumptions but um yeah so so I think that um under plurality she wouldn't have done nearly as well um she shared ideological space with a handful um I think uh, three other candidates for the most part um, that were running out of the seven and uh I don't think she would have done remotely as well, but she could have done well enough to influence the end result considering what the, the difference ended up being. Sorry, I keep looking to this direction because that's where I have the results on a different monitor. No, so. that's okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, the results are, are what we want to talk about a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us, I, I think most people here have probably seen some of the results that we posted online, mm -hmm. but do you want to kind of go down the list real quick and just um, fill everybody in on what those results are and what we um, might take? Yeah, um, so in the end, uh, thanks to uh, ballots being mailed to um, every eligible voter who wanted one in the city, uh, we ended up with 18,805 uh, ballots cast, which I think historically is the largest primary election that we've ever had. So that's something to be said for mailing ballots to people, certainly. Um, the uh, uh, Rochelle Aboa, she got last place in this uh, with 2,976 votes or 16% of the vote. And, um, you know, she got almost 3,000 votes. Um, to put it in perspective, in our last e, uh, in our last commission race in 2018, where while we didn't have 18,000 ballots cast, but we still had 16,000 ballots cast, so, so quite a few, um, you know, the second place winner was you know, got fewer votes than she did um, in this case to, to think about how that worked out, if I recall correctly, so, um, or right around that number. Uh, Bradford Schaefer, who, he was the one who dropped out. He got 17% or just over 3,000. Doug Rimpf, uh, an unknown, honestly. I mean, he was an NDSU professor, uh, but he's retired, and uh, he, this was his first foray into politics. He got a few hundred more than the previous guy at 18%, uh, and then we had a... Um, a man who was very um, uh, supported uh, by one of our seated commissioners um, who rounded out at around 20%. And then after that, we have a huge jump 
up to a seated commissioner who lost his reelection bid, who got uh, 9,000 votes or so, Tony Grinberg. And uh, then our winners, uh, Arlette Preston, who had previously been a city commissioner in the 1990s, but not since. Um, she got nearly 10,000 votes. And John Strand, um, who was running for reelection, was reelected with the most at 55% or 10,393 out of 18,805. So um, as I've made clear to everyone who's asked me about the election so far, approval does not guarantee 50%, but it was nice to see that over half of the voters did support the eventual winners, um, which is, a, I think, just a, a bonus or some icing on the cake for this one this time. So. Yeah, I, I think everybody was pretty thrilled to see that the two winners each had over 50%. Like you said, mm -hmm. it's really important to emphasize that no voting method and approval voting included can get you a majority winner um, if you have more than two candidates in the race. Yep. Um, so when you see those results that two candidates were able to get a majority, um, that really gives them like a, a really solid mandate to govern, right? And it shows that they they had broad support from people across the spectrum if they were able to get 55, 53% of the vote. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, and so that's that's something else that I wanna talk about a little bit here is the, the, the way to calculate that approval percentage, right? So we're talking about 55%, 53% because we're putting the the ballots as the denominator there, mm -hmm. right? We're dividing the, the total number of votes by the number of ballots. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. And what you might see, if, if any of you guys check out the North Dakota Secretary of State website, um, they're still using the total number of votes as the denominator. And so it looks like candidates have gotten a lot smaller amount of the percentage of the total vote um, than what we're saying here, uh, because they're adding up all of those approvals and using that as the as the denominator. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to, if there's anything that you want to say there, Jed. Um, uh, or if yeah, I have, I have a lot to say historically yeah. in my frustration <laughs> with this. Um, so it's an ongoing discussion uh, with the Secretary of State's office and our county um, auditor um, about reporting these things correctly according to the law that we passed, but um, we will get that rectified eventually, I'm sure. Um, the reason, or there, there are several reasons why we chose to go out of ballots cast rather than just somebody voted for at least one and then that's what the denominator is. Um, first and foremost, uh, the election equipment that we were using at the time when we did the initiative would not support making that determination. It could not tell the difference between if you voted for zero people or for one person in a two max vote for two race. Um, and we felt that we needed to have some sort of denominator and allowing them to continue to report percentages as ovals filled in for candidate out of all ovals filled in was certainly not an acceptable solution. Um, so we chose ballots cast. And uh, the second big reason that we chose that was because we don't know why someone doesn't choose to vote for candidates in a race. It may be because they don't approve of any of them. And we, and since we can't tell, uh, there's, you know, we'd rather be out of ballots cast. Uh, we'd rather not infer what their, what their thoughts were there. Um, the, a similar deficiency in the election software that we use um, also prevented us from having a box or a bubble to fill in that says I approve of none of these people or whatever that could have allowed us to find you know they at least filled in one oval so we know how many ballots there are or whatever too so we're kind of thwarted at every turn from maybe what one might consider to be ideal but I think that this is the best possible option given what was available to us. Awesome yeah yeah and it is frustrating because it was written into the initiative that the yeah. denominator <laughs> must be ballot yeah. cast, right? So I, yeah. I completely understand how frustrated you must feel that the Secretary of State, at, at least at the state level, they're not respecting 
what yeah. the, and, the law now says. Yeah, and they're not as, I mean, it's, it's the state, so it's <laughs> they're a little yeah. divorced from uh, from municipal code in that sense. So right. it's okay. We'll, we'll get there. I have a good relationship with them. It's the, right now our problem is dealing with the, the county commissioner or the county um, auditor a little bit, uh, but we'll get gotcha. there. We'll figure it out. I recently received word back and they said that state law prevents them from showing us the ballots as well. Um, so we'll we'll see if uh you know we can make some FOIA action happen despite that or not. I'm not entirely sure. That's a conversation for not here, <laughs> but later. Yeah, so. yeah, that's okay. Well, so um, the next thing that I wanted to discuss then is the the idea that has been pushed before approval voting has seen the light of a an actual government election that most people will just bullet vote, right? They'll, they'll just go ahead and vote for the one candidate, or maybe in this case, since they're allowed to vote for two, or since two people are being elected, maybe they would just vote for those two and no additional ones. Mm -hmm. And so what did we see here in this election with how many um, candidates people approved of? Um, we saw that on average, uh, voters this year voted for 2.27 candidates uh, per ballot. And um, obviously, like guaranteed to be higher than prior years, but prior years were, you know, hovered around the 1.8 mark generally. Um, and yes, yeah, so you, you bring up that bullet voting argument. Um, I remember I was in a radio interview during the, um, the campaign to get the initiative passed. And um, I had an opponent in that particular interview, and he was talking all about how people are going to bullet vote in the face of this. And I said, so your argument is that when people are presented with, you know, the option to vote for more than two, if they want, they're just going to vote for, they're going to bullet vote harder or something like that. Like, it makes no sense uh, to me. And, um, and indeed, uh, the voters apparently didn't do that either, even despite the arguably inflated denominator we're using to make this calculation in the first place. So yeah, um, I don't think that argument held up. There are certainly people out there who bullet voted. And again, I would also point out to this particular individual and those opponents who say that bullet voting is a problem is that no, that is a feature. It is not a bug. This is a good thing. If you only approve of someone, just vote for them. We don't want you to vote for people you don't want. We don't want to force you to rank 10 candidates in order, force you to have a number two or something on a ranked ballot. We don't want that. If you like them, vote for them. If you don't, don't. You still have to make your personal decision. You still have to figure all this stuff out and choose to vote for them on an individual basis if you want. And we aren't going to force you to do it. But in the end, I mean, 2.27 candidates per ballot is what we got. So that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, especially for this being everyone's, their, their first election using this, you already see, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, there's a car horn, horn going off, okay. Um, uh, you, see, you see that this is people's first election using approval voting, and they're already able to vote for two, at least two candidates because they are filling two seats. And so some people, they might have only really cared in the past about voting for those mm -hmm. two candidates. And so to see that the average is more than two is a great thing. And it'll be interesting to see how that changes in the future I'm, as people get more used to it. Yeah, I, I'm confident that there are um, candidates in town who have made it into office because they have, you know, followers who will bullet vote just for them and not... Um, show support to even ideologically similar um, candidates. I'm confident that's the case, but that's always going to be the case. We're not going to change how that works. Um, so, and, but we will discover that um, people who follow that type of candidate, I don't think will be as satisfied with their outcome until they decide that they're actually going to vote on policy and not person um, as they move forward. So we'll find out. Yeah. It'll definitely be interesting to see. And it'll be super interesting to see once we have a single winner election. Yes, uh, which when will be coming up in 2022. Time? I mean, we technically had a single winner election this time for municipal judge, but he ran unopposed. So, <laughs> but we did have a single winner approval voting election, people. Come on, you weren't paying attention to that thing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the single or the uh, the unopposed judge. It's you know those are usually all all over the media, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
so we, we conducted a poll of people in Fargo to see how they felt about approval voting, um, this being their first time. You know, we really wanted to see if people were able to, um, if they liked it, if they didn't. Um, we found that 71% of voters thought it was easy, 62% said that they liked it, and that 62% includes some people who, um, you know, said that they wouldn't really recommend it, or not, not that they wouldn't recommend it, I'm sorry, that was poor, poor judgment on my part, the way that I said that. 54%, um, or the, the um, I am so sorry, I can't find the, the oh, okay, so it was, I, I think what I'm including is the candidate, the people who only voted for the candidate who ended up losing. So that includes the people who voted for some of those candidates who ended up losing, um, still said that they liked approval voting, um, despite the fact that their candidate didn't win. Um, and then we also had 69% who said that they felt like they could vote for their favorite candidate without spoiling the vote, which is mm -hmm. amazing. So have you talked to anybody like on the ground? Have you had friends or family or anyone who told you how their experience was or anything like that? Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, yesterday I spoke with the local Rotary Club and um, they were uh, very happy that those who spoke up, which was over half of them um, who, you know, actually lived in Fargo and are members of the local Rotary. So yeah, they all seemed very happy um, with how it worked out. They felt that they could freely vote for who they wanted to win and they they were um, ecstatic that they could show support to candidates um, that otherwise wouldn't necessarily have gotten support. And uh, I mean, admittedly, the Rotary Club, I mean, <laughs> they're a little more politically and civically engaged than, than most groups. So they you know, were aware of some of these other candidates where the general population wasn't. But um, yeah, and, and just speaking to other people outside of there, yeah, the response has been positive. So, yeah. Awesome. That's good to hear. Um, and then I did, I did want to ask you, I know that, um, you know, this being the first election, we wanted to make sure that voters felt prepared. CES, we did some, we sent out some postcards just to remind people of how it was going to work and um, did a little bit of digital advertising. So I wanted um, to ask you, what, what were some of the things that Reform Fargo did to educate voters and make sure they felt comfortable with it ahead of time? Um, so we did a lot of digital advertising as well. I mean, it was basically all digital. We didn't do any mailers. Mailers are pretty expensive. Um, so we, uh, had there not been a pandemic, our, our approach would have been different, but uh, very much digital, uh, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, uh, Google ads, ads on our local paper online, that type of thing. Um, we also spent um, so a considerable amount of time ensuring that every candidate at least had some type of fair shake presence online. So to that end, we interviewed all the candidates, asked them all the same questions. We um, professionally had it filmed and um, cut together and we um, boosted for all the candidates, we boosted these interviews equally and evenly across all of them to try to make sure that people had a chance to hear from these candidates. And the focus of our interviews, we didn't talk to them about tax policy, we didn't talk to them about, you know, housing justice or anything. Um, to stay within the wheelhouse of our org, we decided that we would ask them questions about government and openness and how they felt the commission should work and, and things like that. And uh, the response that we received to those um, from the candidates was very positive because we were highlighting um, an angle that they're not normally approached from um, when it comes to these questions. Like no one asks candidates about voting method methods, but we do, so, because we're crazy people. And, um, and also uh, for the public, it was very, very positive. You know, thousands of, you know, long engagements on these interviews, many, watched all the way through on several of these interviews to try to learn more about them. And I think that that helped um, the candidates become better known. It helped um, the voting method because we got to show that, yeah, there are good candidates out there, not just the ones that you've heard of historically. And um, yeah, so that all went really well. We also, um, you know, grabbed local volunteers and ran around town and filmed a kind of talking head explainer of what approval voting was. And we aired that explainer uh, not only on the internet, but we also had it running on local um, 
uh, over the air channels and local cable. And on top of that, we had um, several radio ads uh, recorded and running kind of all the time on uh, local radio around here, especially talk radio, because that's what people listen to. So, yeah. yeah, that's that's one thing I'll always remember about Fargo is that you guys like your radio. Yes, we do <laughs> very much. Yeah. It yeah. works. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, and I, th I think the nice thing about approval voting too is that like it's it's awesome that we've all been doing this education to make sure that people felt prepared. But it, if, if there were a world where we just didn't have the resources to do that, the nice thing is that the ballot tells them exactly what to do. And as long mm -hmm. as they could read that, hopefully they they would get it. And it, that's that's the nice thing is it's just so easy. Like it just says vote for all the candidates you approve of. Right? Yeah, so that, absolutely. Yeah, the only problem, the typography was a little squished in there. They should have had better margins, but you yeah. know, I'll, I'll take the county to task later, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the ballot design person over there, we were kind of surprised when we saw the ballots. We, we thought that they kind of looked like they were made in Microsoft Word, to be <laughs> yeah. honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, I think those were the majority of the questions I wanted to ask you. And I know that we had a lot of folks who have um, questions over in the, the group chat. So I will go ahead and start skimming through some of those. Um, so Michael Weinbaum is asking, why does Fargo have at-large seats? In Florida, this often indicates minority suppression. Okay, um, so this is just historic at this point. Um, uh, the Far Fargo has a commission form of government, not a council. Um, so there are no wards in Fargo at all. So it's just four commissioners are elected and then the mayor is elected at large. Um, there's a lot of talk about us changing um, to wards. And um, that's something that I discussed with uh, the Rotary Club yesterday as well. Um, so we'll see if that comes. I, I'm certainly not going to pretend that there's no type of minority suppression here in that sense. Um, it should be noted, however, that you know the demographics here um, differ wildly from what the demographics in Florida are, probably where you are. Um, so it's something that is a long time coming, but just hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. But Reform Fargo is um, definitely researching the issue and trying to figure out if we can be the you know the final nail in the at-large coffin if we need to be, or maybe. Um, get, you know, make Fargo the first place to use sequential proportional approval voting instead uh, to fill these seats and expand the commission at the same time. So are those some things that you reform Fargo and or re reform North Dakota are looking at doing? Absolutely, we are. A little yep. bit more about your plans there. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're, we're considering doing that. Um, we, you know, while there are orgs out there doing ballot initiatives right now during the pandemic, we are not one of them. Um, so it's just, it's, it's too constraining. Uh, yeah. to do this. Um, lots of doors need to be knocked <laughs> to do this the right way, I think. And I don't want to put volunteers at risk um, when they're collecting signatures, as some of these other orgs have, frankly. Um, but yes, we are looking at um, expanding the commission and dividing Fargo into wards. Of course, gerrymandering is a big concern. So that's why proportional methods are, you know, at least to the geeky ones here, we were more interested in. And we're certainly not afraid to try and make Fargo do, you know, be the first in something. So we're, you know, we're willing to bite that off if we think that it has a good chance. Uh, we're also looking at a, um, a novel ward idea where uh, we kind of divide Fargo, for example, into a north and south half and an east and west half and elect people from each of those every cycle. And that would mean that you'd kind of have parts of the wards overlapping with one another. So every citizen would elect someone every cycle. They'd also have at least two commissioners who are considered to be from their ward. And we feel like that could help, um, you know, fight the parochialism that we're worried about, but also allow us to have these wards to maybe um, help to get uh, minority involvement on the commission as well. That is super exciting. So these are all, I know that Right now, it's hard to make plans because of just the state of the world. But so yeah. are these kind of early discussions, you're doing research, or are, do you have like timelines or anything like that? I believe that if we weren't in a pandemic right now, we probably would have been gathering signatures to expand the commission already. Um, we're not fans of kitchen sink kind of initiatives. 
uh, we prefer to keep stuff pretty tight. So even if, you know, if, when we get to the other side of this thing, which I'm convinced we will, <laughs> but when we get to the other side of this, um, in all likelihood, we will push for both of these things, but we'll do it with two separate um, initiatives that we have people have to sign twice. And yes, that takes more time. It's more of a pain for the person explaining things and, and, and it's more of a pain for the citizen who's signing it. Um, but we really would want them both to stand or die on their own and not be something that's drugged through or killed, frankly, by the other half of the initiative. So. But that's something that we're looking at. Um, the first thing though, if we had to pick one, would probably be to expand the size of the commission first. Um, right now we have one North Dakota Senator for every 14,000 North Dakotans, uh, but we have one city commissioner for every 25,000 Fargoans. So um, if we increase that to, um, if we increase the size of the commission, uh, by four, so we double it, so it becomes a commission of eight plus the mayor makes nine, uh, then we'd actually drop down to the 14,000 to match the state. And um, there's talk out there of, you know, maybe expanding the commission by two, but I'm confident we could get support to not only expand it by four, but maybe even six or eight, which would, you know, I think we'd have to have wards at that point or go up proportional. Wards, of course, being the, the devil they know, so maybe more likely to pass. But either way, approval voting would be involved because we would make sure that there are single winner races with approval voting by the end. Awesome, that's, that's really exciting. I'm, I'm really interested to see where things go. So uh, this pandemic, it's just screwing everything up, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, another quick question from Michael Weinbaum, actually at the top, he asked, do we know what percentage of voters approved of both winners and I don't think we nope. know that for sure. No we don't because the county does not provide that data and they won't let us um, yeah. see the ballots to get it. Yep. Yep. We have new new voting equipment ESS something or other um, but I don't think that they even stored that data. It seems to be one of those things where they don't store all the data from the ballot. They store you know the, only the stuff they care about as they're counted. It's not like you know, scanning documents and just logging all of it for them. It's kind of, no, just find these things and ignore the rest. So unfortunately, um, even if they had that data and were amenable, or even if they were amenable to giving us that data, um, they can't just, you know, query your database and, and get it in a creative way. We all have to go through the ballots again. So if we're able to get access to the ballots, um, then we will, you know, find volunteers and we will manually count 18,805 ballots and, and get real. Uh, but until then, we don't have it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, and I think you kind, of already, you kind of already answered this, but Colin Weaver was asking that now that it's finally happened, were there any voters confused or complaining about it? I know you said, you know, it was well received. That's what our polls showed, but have you, have you run into anybody that? Um, not that I know of. Um, you know, beyond, you know, the people who were opposed to this in the first place and were loud about it, they were still loud and opposed to it during, during it, but uh, they're a little quieter now. Um, now that things have, you know, that the election's done and we'll, we'll have another test of this in a couple years, um, for sure. And we had a particularly oppositional voices who are on the city commission and they are both up for re-election in two years so we will see how loud and noisy it gets then that'll definitely be an election to watch yeah um let's see oh looks like um, okay so um um this this is another ballot question rob rob lanfier was asking about the lowest the, the lowest candidate got 16% of the votes. Um, so it sounds like people thought they could only vote for two candidates rather than one. Do we have any idea how many voted for three or more? Nobody um, had heard of Rochelle before, you know, April, to be yeah. honest, or, tr or truly kind of before May. Um, that's when she really made a splash locally uh, with some other events that were going on. Um, so, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's because people were confused. It's possible, certainly. I'm, I'm not a prognosticator. I have no idea uh, for certain, but I can tell you nobody knew who Rochelle, Bradford, Doug, or Ed were until April, May. 
um, of this year, if they ever did, before they looked at their ballot and said, who are those people? I've heard of Tony Arlett and John. I'm going to vote for some of them instead. Right. So. Yeah. And I mean, that's another, you know, kind of separate issue from voting methods, but something that affects the outcomes and affects the way the voting method could function is, are, is everybody getting a truly fair shot at representing who they are and getting the word out to people? Yeah. Right? And it's um, certainly not unheard of. I mean, people need to run more than once sometimes. It, it's, yeah. it's rare for someone to just walk up out of the blue and just win. I yes. mean, it happens. Yeah, I've, I too am familiar with AOC, but that is, you know, that's not necessarily how it works, especially in the middle of a pandemic. So um, it's just, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. And so how do you feel like the pandemic affected the candidates and, you know, their ability to campaign? Do you think dramatically, that it was pretty? Yeah, <laughs> um, dramatically. Um, in my experience, the, the candidates who win um, are the ones who can get their message out, can be heard of, actually make some sort of splash. And in particular, they're able to knock doors and so forth. And um, while I'm not surprised that the three who came out at the top of this, like the definite top, um, were those three, Tony, Arlette, and John, um, th this definitely uh, uh, affected things. They, they had to change their strategies a little bit. And um, the other four, I'm just afraid, yeah, they, they didn't stand nearly as much of a chance without being able to have in-person meet and greets and events and just, yeah, wandering around the neighborhood knocking doors, so. Which you are well familiar with. <laughs> yes, yes, I knocked. Um, Oh gosh, 10,000 plus doors. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. See, so you guys should understand why I was asking at the beginning, how did it feel to fill, <laughs> fill out your approval voting ballot after <laughs> knocking 10,000 doors? And it, it felt great, but this ballot. pandemic just means I'm going to be worried about it until at least 2022, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe they'll implement some uh, online signature gathering. You never know. Oh, don't get into online voting type. Oh, no, no, not voting, not voting. I know, but oh, that, that's pretty adjacent right there. I don't know. <laughs> you have to remember, North Dakota does not have voter registration as well. So it's probably the only North Dakotan in this entire chat. I'd like to remind everyone, we do not have voter registration. Uh, yeah. Voter ID um, only recently happened here. You could vote with just si by signing an affidavit at the polling place uh, when you walked in. You, uh, there are no registered Republicans or Democrats in North Dakota because it's not a thing. You just yeah. you get your ballot and you choose how you want to vote <laughs> yeah. at that time. Right. It's, yeah, definitely unique compared to other states. Oh, yeah. Um, so Colin asks, what was the most surprising thing that happened during this entire process over the last few years? Um, we won. <laughs> so, that's a good one. Yeah, I think that's, it was surprising. Um, it was to me, I mean, I, I was confident in the work that we did, um, but it's still scary. Like I'm, I don't like to count my chickens before they hatch. So, um, I remember even on election night, we're looking at the data coming in and I'm, you know, in the third frame of my game and, and you know, the first precincts are coming in and we're, we're ahead two to one. I'm like, all right, that's great, but there's only a thousand votes in at this point. And then pretty soon, you know, 40 precincts are in and we're still ahead two to one, um, 67%. And I'm like, okay, but we got to wait for it all to be done here now. Um, yeah, so I'm, yeah, <laughs> we actually pulled it off. So that, 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 was, that was a surprising thing. Also, I think, I don't know if it's surprising to me um, because I'm, I like to think I'm generally a pretty optimistic and confident person, but um, I know it was surprising to many at how amenable um, the people were to having this change, to being approached with this change. Um, I had countless conversations uh, with people and just explaining them uh, like to them, you know, this is approval voting, this is why it's better. Or have you ever been frustrated with the commission because of X, Y, or Z? And just watching them light up and being so receptive to this change. People want um, better systems. They just haven't thought about how better systems can be implemented or how they can exist before. So having those conversations is a lot of fun. Um, so, so that was a you know pleasant surprise as we went through the campaign over the last couple of years. Um, maybe 
a genuine surprise to me was just how resistant to change some of these entrenched political uh, forces are. Um, there is, you know, when we received opposition, frankly, it came from people that if you're a local, you've heard of, and they and they didn't like it. <laughs> they just didn't want this thing. Um, so, because it's a, a threat to power, but, you know, the people are where the power is supposed to be, not, you know, the politicians. So, Hopefully we um, continue to move forward and uh, find more issues that are going to work out to the betterment of our city and, you know, everywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've also gotten a few questions about if, if you could kind of talk about how the candidates divided into ideological groups, like what was the split there? If, All right, if, well, I know it's kind of subjective, but if there oh, is yeah, a, a sure. guesstimate you can make. Well, I mean, I did meet all of them and have hour long conversations with all of them. So at least I, I know them a little bit, but yes, I'm, I'm not a political analyst, but I, I will tell you ideologically, if we're looking at right of center, those voices would have been Bradford, Ed and Tony um, on the line would have been probably Arlette and John. And, um, and to the left would have been Doug and Rochelle, uh, to various degrees. Doug was probably the furthest to the left. Ed was the furthest to the right. Um, yes, yeah, so Doug, I would consider to probably be more of a green um, progressive type. I would say Ed is a um, small government libertarian type. Um, John would describe himself as a as socially liberal and fiscally conservative, I think is how he would say it. Um, Arlette is just, um, she would say that she's a Democrat, I'm sure. Um, and um, Tony is a Republican. He's a former uh, GOP uh, legislator uh, locally. Um, so yeah, and then let's see, Bradford, uh, I believe that he was conservative given um, the, the support and where I saw it coming from and um, the Facebook posts of his that I read when I was creeping on him. And um, Rochelle, I would say she was probably the closest to the center of the left um, over there, um, socially liberal, um, but you know, much you know, closer to um, the center than Doug was, for example. And I'm assuming, of course, that there's only one political axis that you could possibly measure anything on, because obviously yeah. <laughs> everybody falls along that line somewhere perfectly, yes. so it's fine. No differences, <laughs> so yeah. Right, so it, it sounds like the two candidates, at least from, from your feeling and, and the way that you're assessing them, um, it sounds like they kind of fall towards the middle of, the, mm -hmm. of that left-right spectrum. Yep. Middle, middle, left, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Interesting, definitely. Yeah, but I would argue Fargo is probably middle left, um, at yeah. least for, you know, I mean, obviously, North Dakota politics are not the same as, you know, Florida politics or New right. York or California <laughs> politics. Um, but I would argue Fargo is generally a left leaning city, even looking at the, the United States as a whole. Um, you know, it's not Austin. It's, you know, mm -hmm. okay, it's not San Francisco, but it's not, but, you know, it's also not Bismarck, North Dakota, which is, yeah. it leans a different direction. So. Yeah, and I, I think that surprises people because um, you, you know, people say weird things in Facebook comments, but I just get the sense that people think, oh, Fargo, it's just that, like, little place out there in North Dakota, they're probably just, you know, they... They're just those flyover people kind of thing, you know? And so yeah. I don't know if that every, I, I think that kind of surprised people when they saw, oh, wow, this place that I don't really think about that much implemented this new reform. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. it's. I, I know they didn't run me through the wood chipper or anything. So we're. Right. You know, we threw the bad elections in the wood chipper though. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, and the actual wood chippers in our visitor center, by the way, if you ever come and visit, uh, you can hold a, deta a severed leg and push it in for a photo op if you really want to. So, Yes, Aaron and I did that when we visited and there's even photo proof of it. I think it's yeah. been on Facebook page. Yeah, we're yeah. like, you know, pretending to yeah. be putting a, a person in it. It, it was yeah. cool to see it though. Yeah. We're the biggest yeah. small town that you've heard of probably in many yeah. respects. So. Yeah. But I mean, I think that's, I think that is really important and like really, 
it's it's such a great thing that a place like Fargo was the first to get approval voting because it shows that it's something that's accessible. It's something that is for your everyday, like average fly over state person, mm -hmm. right? It it doesn't yeah. it's not a reform that you need a ton of money for. You don't need to know math and algorithms for you don't mm -hmm. have to be on the coast like it's for everyone yeah and that was um that's what i think was so important about this yeah that we were we're someone that you wouldn't think would do it but i as i tried to explain to our our opponents uh, when i was you know when we had these debates and so forth and everybody else frankly um change can come from anywhere just because it's a good idea doesn't mean that we have to you know just let california do it or you know texas do it or what have you like we yeah. we can also do this and every day is an experiment when we were told oh nobody's ever done this before we would just uh, oh and oh, no, if it was adopted it was thrown out or something like that it's just i would just point out to them like this we're not trying to treat Fargo like a Petri dish. It's already a Petri dish. Like no other city has a 200, 125,000 people, lies in the middle of the widest, flattest part of North America, is a farming community, has taxes like this, has policies like that, has roads like, like it's all an experiment. The variables are different wherever you go. The idea that, oh, we can't change that variable because then the experiment will blow up is absolutely ludicrous to me. And um, I think that that type of messaging um, really, engaged with people we just completely diffused this idea that uh, we aren't allowed to give a darn about our city and change things if we want and that we're just you know trying to be evil mad scientists that are you know experimenting in the poor defenseless citizens of fargo they they're they're big people they can make up their own minds and vote on it they did and we won two to one love it couldn't have said it any better um Kirsten is asking, are there any policies that you think or hope will be better addressed in Fargo thanks to approval voting? Um, so, yeah, that, that's an interesting one. I got to think about that. So now you're going to make me think about my personal politics beyond this. So um, there's definitely housing issues in town um, that need to be addressed and zoning issues in town. Um, we do seem to have an inordinate amount of uh, property tax adjustments in favor of um, a handful of landowners and developers in the area. And I think that the, the shift in the commission will help to temper that um, further, which I, I frankly think is, is quite important. Um, we also, have, it's... It's interesting. I think Fargo is going to be a better place because of approval voting, certainly because we're going to have more of the will of the people that's enforced. I mean, we, we have, we have commissioners who, you know, think that bike lanes are pointless, for example, on busy roads. And that's, you know, I just, that want to sell off our parks and things and, you know, the people don't want that. Um, but, you know, a fifth of the commission does. <laughs> so it's, it's crazy. And I would, like to make sure that um, viewpoints like that don't stick around um, if they're not what the people want. If the people of Fargo don't want to have public parks, don't want to have public transit, you know, want to, you know, lower taxes, raise taxes, you know, de-zone, build, build a factory in every corner or, you know, make, you know, have draconian housing so that every place has to be perfectly manicured like a, an HOA on steroids, then the people should be able to do that. Um, and, but they need a responsive governmental body to be able to do that. And I want the city to be responsive to the needs of the people. And I think approval is going to get us there. It's already started to shift things a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I think the, the responsiveness is the most important thing, right? Every single one of us has different ideas about policies and politics and candidates. But the important thing is that the government actually listens to all of us and then that they do what is in the best interest of the broad majority, or not the broad majority, the broad, the broad amount of the electorate that is, it's hard to say because we're all so used to using the word majority, but we really can't use that word. You can say plural, pl plurality. I can't say it, but you can. 
Uh, yeah, plurality is a terrible word, plurality. But, you yeah. know, the, if, if, if the most people in Fargo, you know, a broad amount of them want to get rid of the parks, then maybe that's what should be done. But yeah, so um, it's not going to happen. We are the city of parks. That's one of the mottos. But I'm just telling you, we elected a, a guy who wanted to sell off a whole bunch of park assets. And he did, and the city commission doesn't even control the parks. It's a separate entity. Ah, the Fargo Parks District is a separate thing. Like, there's a separate board. Like, it's not controlled by the, ah. Uh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll, get cities, the, uh, we'll get off of the policy subject so that, <laughs> so that we don't don't give uh jed a heart attack or anything so here's here's an even more fun question from steve what were the arguments of people who didn't support approval voting in fargo um so their arguments were people are going to bullet vote uh, voters are stupid they won't understand the ballots uh, we were hit with um it's never been done anywhere before which i think i previously addressed but yes um yeah, you're just experimenting on people. Um, you're, it's just sponsored by coastal elites. Um, the God, they, they love that here. I mean, we are in the center of the continent. So if, if you're allowed to say that anywhere, I guess it's here, but it's still ridiculous. Uh, for people to say it, you know, geographical center of North, North America is in rugby, North Dakota. So don't forget that, everybody out there keeping score at home but yeah um those are the types of arguments we would get it was a lot of frankly it was a lot of fluff um when we get into anything deeper like you know i mean we have to address the bullet voting question um or then you know there were some opponents um, to this certainly who were proponents of change but opponents of this particular change um obviously the you know 1200 pound gorilla in the room is ranch choice voting or instant runoff. And I don't understand they're not the same, but they're used interchangeably. Um, and um, there would be people who say, well, why not that? Why, why this, not that? And then uh, we could just point out to them, well, our equipment's not compatible with ranked ballots, but it is compatible with this. Um, and this is simpler and it's precinct summable. And yeah, by the time you say the words precinct summable to a voter, unless you're like sitting down, like you've lost that voter by the way, so never get that far into the weeds. But yeah, so that's, that's how that works. But yeah, you wanna, um, other things, well, gosh, what are the stuff? Oh, socialist takeover of the city. That That's a good one. Um, this is just so you can get your people elected, um, you know, them not knowing what my politics are. Um, but yeah, your people, um, that, that was always fun when they talk about that type of thing in defiance. And we just ask them, you know, where in this initiative does it say, you know, that, you know, only Star Trek fans are allowed to, you know, be on the commission? Like, where is that language in this thing? So um, there are a lot of people who, when it comes right down to it, like to argue, and they do not argue in good faith with you. And if you are knocking doors or gathering signatures, you just have to learn how to just smile and be extra positive with them and just keep saying the same thing until they either go away or you are able to extract yourself from that situation. So, because in the end, you know, they're grossly outnumbered by the people who are open to at least listening to you and probably open to change. That, that, there was a, you know, a nice thing. I mean, I'll be honest, the opposition did not see us coming. They did not realize that we had volunteers dozens of them they did not realize that we were um motivated and we were going to knock every door in town if we had to they were not prepared for the fact that even though it was inefficient we insisted upon not only knocking doors in neighborhoods where there were you know 20 homes to a block but we knocked doors in neighborhoods where there were two homes to a block because of their gross size in the fancier parts of town. Like we were bound and determined to make sure that we left no stone unturned, that we would knock every door and speak to people from every walk of life in order to educate and hopefully pass it. And um, they organized too little too late. And I suspect should we come up with 
other initiatives in the future um, that they may be more organized if they're opposed to what we're doing and if we ever do have the opportunity to go statewide depending on how this fall goes um, we you know expect to have a much more defiant opposition uh, than we had uh, the last time yeah and i i think it's awesome the fact that you guys did so much outreach and you you clearly see the fruits of your labor in the results because 64% yeah. of people approved of that measure. Not um, only did we win two to one overall, we won two to one in every precinct. Every single precinct, yes. So like that's not supposed to happen. Yeah. Like we swept the precincts. Like even right. the precincts where nine people voted, it was six in favor and three opposed. Like it worked out. So, and by the way, yes, that's that, 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 that's Riley's Acres. That was way out in the, the boonies, but yes, <laughs> there was a really small one on election day. Yeah, so. awesome though. So Chris asks, do you feel that the folks who got elected may feel more empowered now when than they would have before with approval voting and getting over 50%? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I know um, that they, um, the, both of, those who were elected have told me about how um, they know that the people are behind them. One in particular told me that now they feel that there is more of an ally, um, uh, there's more um, weight to what they're going to say um, on the commission because they can say, look, over half of the people or this many people <laughs> voted for me to be here. And, th and that's a really important thing, I think. Um, now, obviously, being elected where four out of five people or six out of seven did not vote for you and you still make it does not necessarily mean that you as a politician are going to um, not act as if everyone is behind you back home, uh, wherever you're elected from. But um, these particular politicians can actually legitimately say it now. And um, commissioners, frankly, couldn't before. This is, these are the highest percent of voter wins we've ever had for the city commission. Just that that's it. <laughs> the mayor, when he runs unopposed, sure, he gets 95% of the vote, but not commissioners. <laughs> it's not how it works. So what were some of the previous percentages that um, commissioners were winning with? Just oh, to give folks an idea. Man, you're going to make me look at well, I, I have it here, but I was... I nope, was, I'll pull it off of my own website. You don't have to look there. Look um, so, I, well, and I have the Secretary of State, and it's it's confusing still because they are doing the, you know, the votes as, yeah. as the denominator. In so 2015, our winner got 21.8% of the vote. That was a single winner race. Um, is a special election due to um, a previous mayor of the city dying and some kind of shifting around where the candidates were. Uh, in 2016, two in a race, um, they won with 30% and 28% of the vote. In 2018, during our signature drive, we had winners who won with 33% and 30%. Um, and I will say that us collecting signatures during an election that uh, the initiative was meant to address was a helpful thing because then we had yet another example of what vote splitting does and how ridiculous it is that we have people who are winning with seven out of 10 voters not voting for them. And it was fresh in people's minds. So to any of you out there who are thinking about collecting signatures, timing is important. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Um, well, I think I've got one more question here from Colin. If anybody else has questions, I think we'll probably want to wrap up here in a few minutes so that Jed can get back to his life and his family. Um, but uh, so get any remaining questions in there real quick. Um, but from Colin, he says, was there a particular interest group that was against it in Fargo other than incumbent politicians who were winning in the old system? I mean, I, I can say how I sense it. There, there was no group organized that came out and explicitly said, no, don't vote for this. There's, there, there wasn't a, a group that, that said that. There, like, um, the Chamber of Commerce 
did not endorse us, but they did not formally oppose us. Um, we did incidentally get um, endorsements from the ACLU of North Dakota mm -hmm. and our local firefighters union, which was yeah. interesting. Uh, but the, um, and I mean, who's going to, you know, fight with a firefighter anyway, but um, that's beside the point. I think yeah. the newspaper endorsed it too, right? For, <laughs> yeah, for so, yeah, 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 the newspaper did too, so which was nice. Uh, but they, um, having formal opposition in that sense, no. But I will say, in general, if we received opposition, the person opposing us was either an incumbent, a political operative, or both. And nine times out of 10, they were conservative in our particular case. So there were certainly, you know, socialists, lefties, liberals, progressives, and Democrats who didn't want this either. But, you know, it, <laughs> you were far more likely to find um, a Republican or a conservative who was opposed. And in particular, we had a large contingent of um, libertarians, self-identifying libertarians who were opposed to what we were doing. I think in particular, some of that was because um, the commissioner who was elected in 2015 with four out of five not voting for him and was vocally opposed to this initiative is a libertarian himself. And I think that there was a lot of local thought leadership in that sense. Um, and that caused many to turn against us before they even knew what we were talking about. It was interesting watching our Facebook ads go up during the time and we specifically, you know, targeted and crafted some for a libertarian audience. And I saw engagement from self-identified libertarians and then them share it to this, uh, to the pages of some of the more prominent officials in town and have them say, no, they're all, they're all socialists. Don't vote for that. And then they change their minds immediately, which, um, as an aside, I think is, I'm pretty sure that's not what libertarianism is, is to just listen to whatever authority tells you, but what, what do I know? I guess so that's kind of how that seemed to have worked out. So, but. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting because approval voting is, it's the way it's set up specifically can help libertarians, green parties, mm -hmm. independent candidates, because in our current system, people won't vote for them specifically because they're worried about throwing away their one precious vote on someone Absolutely. who quote unquote can't win. And so yeah. if you have approval voting, you, those candidates can actually gain support, gain well, traction. Well, some of it happened. I, I do think, I mean, I understand it in the sense that in particularly this commissioner, Tony Gehrig, uh, when he was elected in, in 2015 with four out of five people not voting for him, um, there was significant vote splitting that, that led to him winning. If you looked at the ideological makeup of the, the candidates that were running opposed to him, um, there was a lot of similarity. I think, you know, of the six of them, including him, the five remaining, I believe um, three, if not four, you would consider to be left of center and only one was conservative. I mean, there was certainly um, vote splitting, I think, that contributed to his victory. He's going to hate me for saying it, um, if he ever sees this, but I, I do genuinely believe that that led to part of that. And, and, but I believe that in part because of the conversations I had with actual voters in town at their doors who self-identified as libertarian or libertarian leaning, who told me the only way we can get someone in is with the system the way it is right now and everyone being disorganized. And I didn't hear that once or twice. I heard it a dozen times, <laughs> you know, uh, when I was out there knocking doors. I vividly remember a conversation with one of these voters in, um, you know, after the sun had dropped <laughs> that night in his front yard as I was standing next to some, you know, flamingo lawn ornaments as we were talking about how he said no. <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but this is the only way to get people in is for everyone else to be unorgan disorganized. And I said, but 
what if the, the people in general don't believe in that message and you're only winning because of a, a you know, an anomaly, an artifact of the, the math of the current system. And he just, no, I don't care. I just want to win. And I think that that was a driving force behind many of those who opposed us in that camp. Gotcha. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate when, you know, any reform, no matter what it is, is, is people are um, pushing it in bad faith, right? Yeah. Or lack of reform, I guess, in, in that case, that's a lack of reform being pushed in bad faith. Whereas with approval voting, you were coming in saying, I'm, I'm not here trying to get any specific interest, any spe specific party elected. I just want to make sure that our government is responsive and that the representatives who are elected represent what the people really wanted. Absolutely. And that's just one of the hardest parts about that conversation, though, is that yeah. you, if the problem exists to a point where the people are upset about it or willing to listen to you about improving the system, that means that you have specific candidates and elections to point at. And there are winners and losers from those elections that mean something to the citizens that you're talking to. And that starts to draw lines in the sand, unfortunately, before you get there. It's, it's hard for many to separate the, you know, the math and the mechanics of a better system from the, but how is that going to affect my guy right. type, type thought process? Yeah, I think it's hard because, you know, like the Center for Election Science, we're completely nonpartisan. We're not here to push any particular candidate, any um, political party. But it's when you're talking about election reform, it, it can be really tricky to dis disentangle that from the politics and the people involved, right? And I was actually yeah. just talking about that with the, one of our supporters who's on the line today. Um, Christine, we were kind of going back and forth a little bit earlier um, about, you know, how do we talk about voting reform and how it can help without sounding like we are trying to push any specific agenda because we're not, right? But everybody has, has their own politics and- Yeah, and yeah. It's like, and we, we purposely tried, you know, since there was a lot of outreach to, um, uh, the leaders in these local, you know, political spheres that that were generally opposed to us, and um, we put a lot of time in just to outreaching to them and having legit conversations with them. Yes, the squeaky wheels did get a lot of grease from us. We we tried, and I obviously we had lots of libertarians who voted for this initiative, but you know, they're yeah. noisy people get attention. You know, yes. I mean, I, I'm proof of that. Yeah. I'm absolute proof. We were the of that. squeakiest wheel. Yes, I was ridiculously squeaky, much to the consternation of our commission, no doubt. Um, what you're supposed to do, when I was appointed to the Elections and Reforms Task Force to address this issue way back in 2016, it sounds like what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to just go to these meetings, have some mundane, boring conversations, and recommend a few milk toast things for the commission to pass, and then they can say they address the issue. And that is not how I approach that thing at all. And um, the commissioner who had nominated me said that he got a lot of grief from the other commissioners on like subsequent nominations to boards because they didn't like that he had appointed an activist to that first board. And I wasn't an activist is the thing. Yes, I won now, but I was not someone, you know, standing on the street corners is you're going to city hall and you know carrying a placard that you know <laughs> that screams about park districts and things i was not one of those guys at all i always voted but beyond that no uh, but they made me one because they fought so darn hard not to do their darn jobs <laughs> and now i uh, yeah they lit a fire under me and i don't know if it's gonna go out it so. doesn't seem like it. You you seem pretty yeah. fired up. So yeah. that's good. I, I like yeah. fired up Jed though. It's exciting. Um I do have to say about the libertarians, I want to call out that Pat Dixon and um Rock Howard in, in the chat are talking about how um the Libertarian Party of Texas uh just had an approval voting. Um they had their, their national convention this weekend. Yeah. They use approval voting. So 
that's super exciting and yeah. to them for, for endorsing it. Start sending letters to the libertarians up here. Cause I mean, yeah. we, we had, we coordinated th those types of calls. We had larger national officials whose names escape me, forgive me, but you know, we, we had these conversations. We had emails exchanged. I got people in touch with one another uh, to discuss these things, but it's, <laughs> I don't, it was funny. The, the political leaders that are libertarian here very much were libertarian in the sense that I could think of where they're, it's like, they're, they're recalcitrant, you know, stubbornly defiant in the face of authority. I'm going to make up my own mind. Yet the other, you know, citizens who identified as it were not necessarily of that same band. And it was just, it was interesting to me. But that being said, again, there were plenty of libertarians who supported us. We were very proud. We had a um, seminal uh, former, uh, libertarian gubernatorial candidate in our state was on our sponsoring committee. We had, we were very purposeful, by the way, we got a libertarian, a Republican, a Democrat, a centrist, and a socialist all to sit on our sponsoring committee for our ballot initiatives. So then if anybody ever said, well, this is just going to help blah, 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 I could point at a name that they've heard of because we got people you've heard of that are local and said, no, actually, this person's on this thing too. And they support this so it was a that's another thing that i would recommend um if you're able if you're in one of those states where you're fortunate enough to be able to do initiatives work your butt off find that democrat that republican that libertarian that socialist that green that centrist find the ones that other people have heard of and convince them to be on your sponsoring committee like we were only required to have three people on our sponsoring committee we had well I don't know, I can't count nine or six or eight or some number that's more than three on that thing so we could get enough butts in those seats so we could diffuse any of those political arguments by just pointing at a name if it really came down yeah. to it. I love that. That's awesome advice. And I, I, um, I want to make sure that we can get off here in a timely manner. So let me just ask you this last question, which kind of goes along with what you were just saying. So do you have any advice for people who might want to run an approval voting campaign? Um, it's a lot of work. It's fulfilling, but it is a lot of work. Um, and I'm not trying to scare you. It's more work than you think it's going to be though. But you just have to believe in what in the heck you're doing. And that, that, that's, that's what it comes down to and not be afraid to put yourself out of your comfort zone. I'm, I've, now I have a lot of experience, you know, being on television and speaking on the radio and giving speeches and so forth. And some of you have attended those, you know, and I have, um, you have to be an advocate for this thing all the time, but in a friendly way, you got to be able to put your personal politics aside and be um, objective about this change and be able to advocate for it in that way. But you also need to think about it. You not only do you need to be able to put your politics aside, but you need to be able to put those political pants back on sometimes and the pants of other people to be able to speak to voters from their perspective, help them understand a case for why this is also good for you, even though I'm not really like you politically or for this person, you got to be able to you know, make those arguments and you got to be willing to change how you're doing some of your arguments too. Um, if you said the word plurality to someone you're trying to get a signature from, you're probably already too far into the weeds. Okay, that, that's what it is. Like, if you say monotonicity to someone, you've probably gone too far. Not always. I am, and by the way, to be clear, I'm not saying that voters are stupid. I hate that, that notion. I'm not saying that at all but voters have not thought about this stuff. They get their ballot, they fill it out, and they drop it in a box and they're done with it. They've never thought to themselves, well, I could rank them, or maybe we could write an essay about who I think should be mayor, and then we could have a whole bunch of retired elementary school teachers grade them and pick a mayor out of a hat. Like, I, like they've never thought that there's another way to make these choices before. So you have to approach them um, in a simple and direct way, but be willing to go there if you have to. Uh, 
yes, I had conversations about what it means to be non-monotonic with someone who liked RV because they had seen a purple ad on Facebook at one point in the past, okay? But for the most part, people haven't seen those ads. They haven't seen any ads. They don't know. They've never thought about it before. They're, they are right for the picking in that sense because they this is an undeveloped space. I have said several times in the past that if I walk into a room and I yell abortion, everybody has an opinion. They've heard of it. They have an opinion. You might be able to sway them in a few years of intense debate if you want to do that. They have opinions already, but if I walk into a room and I go, election method, approval voting, it is crickets. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Take advantage of that. You can use that. That is part of why um, IRV is becoming synonymous with election reform, though. However, online, when you run into this stuff, when, when I browse Reddit, when I browse Facebook, I still see, you know, like, this is why we need ranked choice voting. And like, no, this is why we need election reform. So I do think time is of the essence in making sure that we get more cities, more counties, more states under our belt um, using a better method out there. Because right now, IRV is kind of becoming genericized in a bad way. <laughs> you know, it's not the only reform out there. I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I'm just saying it is not the only game in town and I don't think it's as good as approval voting. And um, you just got to be willing uh, to get out there. Knock a lot of doors, but also, gosh, I don't know. As I give you all a pep, pep talk for a campaign that you're not running right now, but also be willing to take breaks and give yourself your own time too. But it is gonna be a lot of work. During that summer, I, uh, four or five nights a week, I was either gathering signatures or knocking doors um, for you know the bulk of it. It is what it is. We had other volunteers too, but other volunteers are other volunteers. They're not who you are. You're the organizer. You need to make sure that you're leading by example and going out. You can't call and be like, well, I thought you were going to go out today. No, it's got to be, I thought we were going to go out today. That's how you make sure that you keep going out there and you have other people to help them, to help. And then, then you knock a few doors and they're knocking with you. And then pretty soon they're taking one side of the street and you're on the other. And then pretty soon you're three blocks apart from each other and you're going to meet in a little while once you, you know, once you get to the end of your uh, um, area your precinct that you broke out. Um, so you will get there. You can lead other people to do it. Um, just have, you know, just be sure of what you're doing and be, you know, and, you know, but don't lie. <laughs> be, be, be confident in what you're doing, but don't lie to them. Tell them, you know, this is hard work. I, I don't think that it's perfect, but I think that it is a great plan and we're going to do it and we're going to do it together and you can get a lot done. I don't know, something like that. I don't know. I try to say everything assuming that it's going to end up on the internet and in some sort of history book somewhere. So I'll make it all flowery. I'll use some big words maybe, but yeah. No, I, I think that was great advice, um, especially just the way you ended it, like just being authentic and just being straightforward about what the benefits are. And if somebody asks you about a weakness that really is a weakness, it's okay to say, yeah, like there is no perfect voting method. Nothing's ever going to be 100%, but this is an amazing improvement, right? Um, so Thank you so much, Jed. I, I, we all really, really, really appreciate all the work you've done to get approval voting implemented in Fargo and the fact that you continue to um, humor us and, and uh, join in on our online uh, events. I know I'm always bugging you with these, so thank it's you. Okay. <laughs> um, and we've had some folks in the chat saying that you are the man, have to tell you that, and yeah, uh, folks yeah. saying thank you for all of your hard work. Um, uh, Kathleen from the League of Women Voters in St. Louis, who they're next <laughs> up, hopefully. Yeah, um, she hope said, so. she said, thanks so much. You've, you've given uh, the folks in St. Louis a lot of hope. Um, oh, so hopefully that, that makes you feel good because you've, you've uh, done an amazing job. So. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to help. And this, yeah, if any of you want to email me, you can email me at um, jed at reformfargo.org. 
and I'll, I will attempt to get your email at some point. <laughs> I'm happy to respond. Or you can find us, find contact information at reformfargo.org as well. I haven't updated the thing since the election, but you can watch all the candidate interviews for candidates that you'll never vote for if you want, but uh, they're on there. They're really good. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> worked hard on them. So, oh. um, but yeah, um, and I'm, I'm happy to participate in these types of discussions generally, just not Thursdays. That's volleyball night. So just not Thursdays. Definitely don't miss out on volleyball. Yeah, that's right. I, uh, I'm, I'm a dominant force in sand volleyball. I'm six foot nine. So <laughs> like, I don't even have to jump out there. So you got to watch out. <laughs> yeah, the, I, I wouldn't want to go up against you playing volleyball for sure. Um, well, and and we're at the bottom of our league and wins, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I won't tell. Um, and just so everybody here knows, we are trying to find kind of the next Jed, the next Fargo. We want to give out some grants to people who are able to, you know, send in a good proposal for a campaign in their area. Um, so we have um, put together an RFP, a request for proposals. So you guys can check that out in the link that I just sent in the chat. Um, but we are accepting those through early to mid-September. I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't have the date off the top of my head. Um, but check out, check, check out that link and see if that's something that you might be interested in applying for. Um, we, we really want to find more cities and help, help get them um, better elections like what Fargo is doing. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Jed. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone on the call. Thank you all so much for your support. I know many of you have been around for a while and you may have even contributed contributed to um, the Fargo campaign. Um, so we really appreciate all of you as well and look forward to working more with you in the future. So thanks to everyone and have a great night. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. <laughs>